Good afternoon, everybody. So my staff said, why are you going to Uppsala, Sweden to give a speech? And I said, every now and then, I'd like to give a talk about cancer in a country that has a working health system. Uh, <laughs> that's you. <laughs> I also tried to get a haircut today because I didn't have time before I left Washington because we had a board meeting with Mr. Biden yesterday. And I walked through Uppsala today and I saw like 10 barber shops, each of which had one barber. And so they were all busy. They had 10 chairs, but only one barber. So I thought, what would President Trump tweet about that? <laughs> and and I, what, I, what I figured out was, Sweden... Barbers flee socialism. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I want to talk to you today about a question about three cancer patients and my mother. Okay? Here's the question. When we started the cancer moonshot, we were gathering about 20 government agencies around the table to double our rate of progress in the prevention, detection, diagnosis, treatment, and survivorship of cancer. So when you're looking at people who are running a bureaucracy, and it's the last year of an eight-year government, they're exhausted, they don't have any new money, they're skeptical, they're jaded, they've been beaten up by the Republicans for a long time. What would you ask them to do to change the way they were doing their day-to-day -day work in cancer? And these groups were diverse, from NASA to the National Endowment for the Arts to the Agriculture Department, the Environmental Protection Agency, Defense, Energy, the Veterans Affairs, National Cancer Institute, the NIH, the National Science Foundation, the Commerce Department, the Patent Office. And so they don't always have a lot in common. And as a history major, I know the value of questions which are often more important than the answer. Answers change over time, under circumstances, and you see this today in politics. <clears throat> and yet the questions, the really critical questions, are, all, are, are sort of eternal. But we get different answers, that's why history books constantly get rewritten. So I was thinking, what is the single question that would make this group really do something differently? And the question I came up with was, how do each of you in your agency touch the patient in their journey from avoiding cancer through prevention, through finding it, diagnosing it correctly, treating it properly, and helping people survive financially, socially, psychologically, and physically? What are you doing today that touches patients? And if you've never thought about it that way, please go back and talk to your staff and ask them that question and rethink everything you do in that context. And look around the table and find a company, not a company, but an agency that you've never worked with before and do it something new with them. And to my wonderful surprise, that's exactly what they did. So the National Cancer Institute started working with NASA on radiation studies. The National Institutes of Health started working with the Department of Energy, which has the world's fastest computers. And I'm not making this up. They can do a million billion computations a second. Think about that. It's incredible. An aside comment, but just because this is a fact that I learned recently I couldn't believe. The head of Google's quantum computing group, it's the only existing quantum computer, told me that even the DOE computers cannot solve the traveling salesman person problem if it has 25 cities. How do you, as a traveling salesman, go to 25 cities in the right order? It's so many variables that the best computers can't solve it. This was amazing to me, considering that we can go through the universe and land on Mars and do all kinds of things. And quantum computers are being developed because they don't have those limitations. It's fascinating. End of sidebar. I just wanted to share that with you because it's a wow. So the moonshot ended up promoting 80 new initiatives, about 20 inside the government, 
and the rest in the private sector because we did a call to action asking everybody in the country who wanted to be involved in cancer, what can you do in your community? And it doesn't matter if you're Deloitte or a university or a small foundation or a family or a hospital or a doctor's office. There's always something you can do to help patients, even if it's just watch their dog while they're going through chemotherapy. Because reasons people don't go to the doctor, they have a life. And they can't always take time off from their life. We forget that. So the moonshot was only nine months long, but we managed to get the attention of the government at the last of the Obama administration. And those 80 initiatives we have followed all this time, two years now, and people are doing what they said they were doing. Uber has a national program to give people free rides to the clinic for chemotherapy and clinical trials, paid for by the hospitals. Deloitte is sponsoring a $10 million X Prize for new methods of early detection. The Leukemia Lymphoma Society started a whole new way of doing a trial in AML. Sloan Kettering started doing genomic sequencing in hard-to-reach populations outside New York City. Family Reach, an organization that helps pay for people to go through clinical trials by paying their expenses, started doubling the effort. They show up and offer to help people pay their expenses and people don't believe them. People don't, they think it's a scam. Because who would pay me my expenses for me to go into a cancer trial? And the answer is people who think it's important that everybody have an opportunity to go to a trial if that's their last best chance of being cured. So, as you know, we had to leave involuntarily um, at, the, at the moonshot. And even though the Trump administration at the top did not take on the moonshot, all of the agencies are still doing everything they said they were doing, including a collaboration with Sweden on the, getting prote, proteogenomic, proteomic and genomic data into the genomic data commons at the University of Chicago. So all of that is continuing. So here are the three cancers. I was diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic leukemia as the result of doing a physical. I always tell people physicals aren't that useful, don't do it. And now I really tell them don't do it because I did one and I got leukemia. Um, but I, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. It's a funny story, which is not the usual story in cancer. But the very beginning of the story shows a problem with our system. I did the physical on a Monday. On a Thursday, I flew to San Francisco, and I called my doctor because when I landed, it was almost closing time in Washington, and he doesn't work on Friday. And I said, how was my physical? And he said, your cholesterol is better, your PSA is fine, but by the way, you have leukemia. Now, the joke I make in America is I'm from Arkansas, and I went to public schools. But even in Arkansas, that's not how we use by the way. <laughs> Usually it's like, by the way, you have a piece of tissue paper on your shoe. Not by the way, you have leukemia. Why was that such a shock? The test to determine whether I had leukemia takes 20 minutes. It was done on Monday. My doctor hadn't called me for four days. There are some leukemias I could have died by flying. I could have gotten a blood clot. Fortunately, not my leukemia. So I was treated, I knew that I would be fine because of the tr progress in uh, CLL. The same time I was diagnosed, my friend Alex was diagnosed with glioblastoma. And I knew she had about 18 months and she would go through surgery, chemo, radiation, and a clinical trial, and none of it would work. It might help a little. I did my treatment a year after my diagnosis for six months. That's 18 months. The month I completed my therapy, she died the next month. And the punchline is, in the last three months of her life, she was commuting from New York City, Park Avenue, to Boston to a, for a clinical trial at Dana-Farber in her condition. I'll come back to that. The third one is my friend Bard, very healthy, wealthy guy I knew for 30 years, who got multiple myeloma, which is a treatable disease now in many cases, but not his. 
They gave him three years. He died in three years. He funded a trial at Fred Hutch in Seattle, one of the best places for this. A year and a half later, it still had not started. He gave his tissue to Dana-Farber to be in a trial there, and they changed their mind about doing the trial because they wanted to audit the data from the previous phase. He flew to New York to get in a CAR-T trial, and when he got there, they said, when was your last chemo? And he said, two weeks ago. And they said, oh, that's too recent. You have to wait two more weeks. So he flew back to Seattle and then back to New York. This is not a good system. In my case, my doctor didn't seem to notice I had leukemia the day he did the test. My friend Alex, there's very little hope in GBM. We're making some progress in molecular targets, but we have a long way to go. But my friend Bard had the money, the contacts, the resources, and still could not get a clinical trial for him that worked even after he was finally able to get into one. So what does all this have to do with my mother? At the Biden Cancer Initiative, my mom says to me every week, my mom's 95 years old and on fewer medicines than I am. And she says, son, what do you do? And I explained to her, well, we're working on data sharing and data standards and better clinical trials and we're trying to get... And she says, I, I don't understand. And I said, mom, I think I know the problem. We are trying to create the cancer research and care system that you think we already have. Think about it. In the United States, people assume that if something good happens to a patient in St. Louis, that somebody in Boston knows about it. They don't. People assume if a clinical trial fails, everybody knows why. They don't. People assume that researchers working in the same disease are constantly sharing information and breakthroughs. They're not. People assume they can get their medical records and move it to another hospital or get a second opinion easily, online, electronically. They can't. In the United States, in 2018, none of that works. So that's what the Biden Cancer Initiative is doing. We, we're working on data sharing to unite the different data repositories that already exist. We're working on data standards doing one thing. We're trying to get one thing right fast, which is immunotherapy, checkpoint inhibitors, require people to measure the immune response to the drug. But every company does it differently to get an advantage on their label. Well, that's bad for patients. I want to know if the immune response is 10%, 30%, 90% as a standard measurement, not as Merck's measurement or Pfizer's measurement. So we're working with the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the U.S. to set a standard for how we measure immune response that the FDA could require people to use. Now, patients are at the center of everything we do, so we're creating a patient navigation roadmap that lets people know if you have a diagnosis of cancer or someone you know, you can go to our resource of resources and get trusted, verified data about the problem you're dealing with. And at the same time, we're working now to have a national summit in the fall that will involve a national meeting in Washington with Mr. Biden, but 500 community summits around the United States where each workshop develops their own initiative to help patients in their own way in their own community. Now, at the end of the day, we talk a lot about patients, but it's pretty clear that my doctor's office was not designed around me. It was designed around him. When I had my chemotherapy and I had to be in the hospital for the first treatment, hospitals are designed around the doctor, not around me. That's why they take my blood at 4 in the morning because it's easier for the doctor if all the work is done when he shows up at 9 o'clock, right? My friend Alex having to commute from one of the world's greatest medical cities to another great medical city is outrageous when they could easily combine the protocol among different centers. So here's my, my plea. We all think that we live in a world that's designed around people that are being served by the system. If you go into a restaurant, you know that the, the cleanliness, the timeliness, 
the taste is all designed to please the customer. If you go to buy a car, everything they do, the smell of the car, the look of the car, the, the compliments they give you when you walk in, oh, you look like the kind of guy who wants a Maserati. It's all designed around you. You go in the medical system, you're a bystander. You're a spectator. And often you're collateral damage of what's going on in the lab that doesn't involve you. So at the end of the day, the moon, when people ask me, why did the moonshot even start if you only had nine months? I point out to people, first, nine months is enough time to have a baby. And my assistant in the moonshot just had a baby uh, five weeks early. So you don't even need nine months. But more importantly, we have to start starting things that put the patient at the center. And if people think they have to have a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, they're mistaken. You need a now plan. You need a today plan. As the song says, I don't want to wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow starts tonight. And that's what we did in the moonshot. We said, you know what? Nine months isn't enough to finish any of this, but it is plenty of time to get it started. And in the case of my friend Alex, it was half of her life. In the case of my friend Bard, it was a quarter of his life. I'm hoping that we can keep that in mind when people say, don't be too bold, don't be too urgent, because these things take time. They may take time, but starting does not take time. Starting just takes commitment. And I know you all are committed, that's why you're here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I know you can go on for 30, 45, <laughs> 50, and, and it's enjoyable. Uh, but we have some, maybe some questions or comments from the audience. <clears throat> By now? Yes, so, please. Uh, you need a microphone, I think. Stand up or raise oh, your yeah, hand. Yeah, please stand up. So I can see you. Stand up also when you ask the question. There we have the gentleman to the left. Do you see him? Uh, not yet. There. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Arun Gupta from India, from NGO Win Over Cancer. Yes. So, I'm also a CLL patient, CLL plus Richter's. Now, you are, uh, you have touched based on a very important part, which, which is data compilation and data sharing. So, are you, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yep. Now, this is something which we were discussing on, uh, in our last session as well. Now, just wanted to understand, like, how do you, can you, can you, uh, can you explain it in more detail on how you are doing it in U.S. and whether you want to cover other geographies as well? Yes. Um, our, our initiative is designed to not be a huge hundred million dollar thing that gives out money because that's not Joe Biden's superpower. Joe Biden and Dr. Biden, his wife's superpowers, are their authenticity on this issue due to the loss of their son to brain cancer and because he can convene anybody we need to talk to and either persuade them or shame them to do the right thing. Now, cancer politics are the worst. And several members of our board who are oncologists or researchers told Mr. Biden, you will get us to do things our peers cannot get us to do. So what we are designed to do, and we're only seven people, we're designed to catalyze activity in the community, writ large and internationally. And in fact, if there are people here who want to host a summit workshop on September 21st in conjunction with the one we're having in Washington, let me know and go to our website, bidencancer.org, and you'll get all the details you need to do that. But the important part is, we're not funding research. We're not a service organization. We're not trying to own things. We don't want people to give us their data. We are trying to catalyze the change that needs to happen to take the break, not off the immune system, but off the cancer research system. Because the progress we've made has been made with the break on. We have no idea how fast things can go if we share information more than once a year at the big conferences. And if we ask people, what are you doing in your company to help the people who have cancer who work for you? They will respond, but if nobody asks, they don't think about it. And that's what we're doing. 
Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you.